All right, sorting algorithms. Before we start talking about sorting algorithms, I want to be very clear about something. You know, the, the first general purpose algorithm we looked at was like searching, a linear search, right? Obviously, every piece of code we wrote before the linear search was an algorithm. There's no offense or buts about that. But the linear search is kind of like this first general purpose algorithm. It's, it's your first time that you see an algorithm that's going to pop up a lot. How many times have you seen a linear search in this course? Wait, I realized that you went to like raise your hand. And I was like, yeah, I just raise your hand if you've seen many, many, many examples of linear searches in this course. Of course you have, right? And they're all a little different, but they're all the same. Sometimes it was, tell me if this thing exists or not. Tell me the index of where it is. Tell me the index of the largest thing. Tell me the index of the smallest thing. Tell me. They're all variations of the same idea of the linear search. So that's kind of what I mean when I was saying like your first general purpose one. <laughs> and that algorithm's not too bad. But after we talk about our linear searches, the next big chunk of algorithms we, we talk about often in computer science and learning is, uh, is sorting algorithms. Now, sorting algorithms are, okay, let, let me put it, raise your hand if you've ever sorted anything ever in your life. Of course you have, right? It's a ridiculous question. Of course you have. Maybe you sorted things by color, alphabetically, by height. Numerically, whatever, it, you sort of thing. And whether you thought about it or not, when sorting those things, you followed an algorithm. <clears throat> Obviously that algorithm wasn't Python code, but the algorithm you followed was some set of rules that you did in order to achieve the goal of sorting something. So if you tried to sort something and you ended up sorting the thing, you followed some algorithm. And I'm willing to bet that of the three algorithms we'll talk about in this topic, the sorting algorithm that you've used in the past is going to be one of these three. The, the thing, though, is you probably didn't, you, you wouldn't have thought about the, the, the instructions you followed for sorting probably very much. You just, you just sort it. But you never took the time to be like, well, how good was that? How many steps did it take? Could I make it better if n was bigger or smaller? How would it change the amount of work I have to do? You probably didn't think of that, right? And on top of that, these algorithms that we're going to describe, even though you probably executed them, these algorithms are non-trivial. They are not easy. You should not expect in any way to look at an example of the algorithms that we're going to look at and be like, I know what it's doing. No, that's not going to happen. If it does, you're probably lying. Because they're non-trivial. There's some complexity to them. Now, assuming you're sitting near someone, and if you're not, just think to yourself, try to articulate to yourself, what was the process that you follow. Like if I gave you a stack of papers and you had to sort them alphabetically, how would you do that? Think about the steps you would do as a human to sort those things. And like break down those steps in a way as if you were writing an algorithm. But talk amongst yourselves or just think to yourself, what would the steps be that you do, that you follow, to sort that stack of papers alphabetically? I'll give you a moment to think about that. You can talk to each other, you can talk to yourself out loud, whatever. being too quiet to be talking amongst yourselves at least. <clears throat>
over them, you fall. Well, I'm going to start pointing at people. That's how you would do it. That's how I do it. Okay, interesting. Interesting. It's kind of what they call like a, a bucket sort or a rating sort. There's a name for that. It's a good way to sort things. It's how I sort things if I'm sorting a pack of exams, because it's a lot easier. What else? So you go through and you find the one that has, I don't know, Aaron, right, AA, and you find them and you put them in the other one. And then this pile over here is all the sorted. Then you find someone whose name comes immediately after that, and you do that. So you like build this sorted list as you go, and this list, this unsorted list, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. That's called a uh, <coughs> selection sort. That's what that sorting algorithm is called. What else? Yeah. Um, let's say you have one giant unsorted list, and for example, maybe uh, all of the uh, every element in the list is a number or something. So you'll check the first number, say if it's the number two. So you compare that to the one next to it, say if it's the number one. If the number one is has a lesser value than two, then swap its places, and then do the same for the next thing and the next. When you hit the end. Okay, so that one's called bubble sort. You compare adjacent things, if they're out of order, switch them. And do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, you end up with a sorted list. Sorted stack of exams, whatever. Cool. What else? Let's see if we give uh, any other any other one. Yeah? If you kind of let them go through the list and figure out what the first like, name is on the list and bring it to the final end of the pile, then go back through the list and then bring that up to the second position in the pile. Kind of. So that's kind of the same as what he suggested back there. Except he specifically said we had two piles, where you're saying, like, well, it's, it's one pile, but you, know, you just keep the first bit always sorted. So it, it's actually, that idea is the same sorting algorithm. Uh, insertion, selection sort, just done slightly differently. And I'm actually glad you said that, because that gets to this point here, is <clears throat> what makes these sorting algorithms distinct is not the specifics of the individual implementation of those sorting algorithms. It's the general idea of that sorting algorithm. Right? So the, the idea of Find the smallest thing, put it in some sorted pile. Find the next smallest thing, find the next smallest thing. All right? Bubble sort is comparing adjacent things. There's another one called insertion sort, where you pick something and you insert it into a sorted pile where it would belong. So it's similar to uh, selection sort, but instead of always finding the next smallest thing, to put to like append it to the end of the sorted pile, you just take the next thing from the top of the unsorted and you find where it belongs in the sorted pile. Raise your hand if some variation of those three, four, I guess, was basically how you've sorted things in your life. Put up your hand, I know it is. Of course it is. So the good news is, You've actually been doing a well-defined sorting algorithm. You should probably never really thought about it like that. The bad news is, they're all absolutely terrible sorting algorithms. They're bad. You've wasted so much time in your life sorting things this way. Except bucket sort. Bucket sort's great. <clears throat> all right. Selection sort. Here's selection. This is, the, this is what the two of you had kind of said. Go through the pile, find the next smallest thing, 
appended to the end of the sorted part of the collection. So, oh, zero is the smallest thing I've seen, put it in the beginning. One's the smallest thing I've seen, put it to the beginning. Two is the smallest thing, just there. Three now is, put it there. And so on and so on and so on. That's selection sort. I'll come back, but let's just jump down to uh, insertion sort. Uh, that's a terrible. Here's bubble sort. You take the thing at the beginning and you swap it with, uh, with whatever's bigger till you get to the end. And you repeatedly do this process over and over and over and over and over again until it's sorted. Isn't that fun? How's this for a sorting algorithm? I have, a, I have a, an unsorted list. I just shuffle them and check if it's sorted. Is that a good one? If it's not sorted, just do it again. No, why, why no? Because you. It's kind of a stupid question to ask why is it bad? You're like, but it could be. Because it's it stupid. It takes so long, depending on how many things. Like, if you took a deck of cards and tried to do that. Yeah, you're, so you're out of luck. Long. Yeah. That's called a bogo sword. Would that just be like the factorial of the amount of things in the list? Is the chance of shuffling it in the correct order? So, that would have like a, a probabilistic one. The reality is. It would, there would be a way to calculate it if you were guaranteed that every time you shuffled it, you got a different order. Uh, but it is possible that you shuffle it a million times and you get the exact same permutation every time. So technically it could run forever. Don't do BOGO sort, it's terrible. But what's the best case scenario time complexity of BOGO sort? One. One? Why? You just sort it on the first step perfectly. Interesting. So we just get really lucky and it just so happens that it's sorted. So you're, you're, you're missing an important thing. And I suppose it's kind of because I'm saying like, well, there's a trick to this question. Technically it would be N because we need to confirm that it is sorted, but I never really emphasized that. So if I had a list of size N, how long would it take to know if it's sorted? Just kind of do a linear search and see if anything's out of order, right? And then we'll know it's sorted. <clears throat> Basically what I mean is, if I'm at index i, and the thing at index i plus 1 is less than me, we're in, we're, it's not sorted. If that, if that is the case anywhere, then it's not sorted. If it's the case that index i and index i plus 1, if the thing at index i plus 1 is greater than or equal to me for all cases along that list, then I know we're sorted because nothing's out of order. So that would still be linear time, n, where n is the length of the list. But let's go back to selection sort. It's fairly accessible. Chances are you've sorted things in real life using this algorithm. Selection sort works by repeatedly selecting the smallest element that exists in the unsorted pile and putting it at the end, appending it to the end of the sorted pile. Now, you don't necessarily need two separate piles. You can implement it such that it's one list and you just know which index is where the unsorted part starts, whatever. But that's the general idea. Go through, select the thing that's the smallest and append it to the end of the sorted bit. Keep doing that over and over and over. We're good to go. To really about how it works, like let's try to intuitively prove to ourselves that this would work. The first time the linear search through the unsorted pile needs to go through and find the smallest element, right? The smallest element that exists in the unsorted pile. I take it out. That element is no longer in the unsorted pile. I put it in the sorted pile. It's the only thing there at this point. Whatever. 
Now I repeat, I do a linear search through the unsorted pile, and I, small, I find the smallest thing in the unsorted pile. Is it possible that this thing should come before anything in the sorted pile? Uh-oh. If I go through the sorted pile, and I do a linear search through the sorted pile, and I find the smallest element that exists in there, I take it out, and I put it in the sorted pile. The sorted pile now, after taking that thing out, has one thing in it, the, the element I just took out of the sorted pile. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to do a linear search through the unsorted pile, and find the smallest thing that exists in there and I take it out, and I want to append it to the end, add it to the end of the sorted pile. But the question comes up, how do I know it goes there, in the sorted pile? Is it possible that the element I just took out should actually be in front of the thing in the sorted pile, should come before it? I want to add it after. Is it possible that it should come before? I'm going to say no. No, why? Absolutely. Because if it should have gone in front, I would have found it the first time because it would have been the smallest thing. So I'm guaranteed that every time <coughs> I go through this unsorted, I'm going to find something that's bigger than, maybe equal to, but bigger than the last thing I just took out. Because if it was smaller than it, I wouldn't have taken out the bigger thing the, the time before. It's not possible, because I did a linear search for the smallest thing. So we'll skip the activity, I suppose. But <laughs> let's think about how much work. Look at this picture here. Remember with a linear search. If I have 10 things in that list, how many things do I have to look at to guarantee I know if the thing's in there or not? Yell out the answer. Ten. If it's 20, how much? 20. If it's n, how much? N. If I double n, how much? 2n. Two two n. Double the amount, double the input, double the amount of work. Now, how much work is involved with this sorting algorithm based on the input size. How much work is there? Because let's think for a moment. With the linear search, it's just I have to put my finger on each element. Right? But, you know, let's break this algorithm down. The selection sort algorithm. I go through the unsorted pile and find the smallest thing. What is that? Do we have an algorithm to describe what that process is? Linear search. A linear search. How much work is a linear search? N. N. Assuming N is the input size. Great. I find the smallest thing, I put it over here. I have to do that again. Right? I have to do a linear search again. Put it over here. I have to do another linear search. How many times do I have to do a linear search? N. N. I have to do N things. I have to look at N things N times. But of course, every time this list gets a little smaller, right? First time it's got N things in it, then the next time it has N minus one things, and then N minus two things, and so on, right? What were you going to say? Yeah, but, <laughs> so it's like, so on average, how big is this pile going to be, the unsorted pile, on average? N divided by two. N divided by two, because when the time it's n, it's empty. n minus one, it's one. 
n minus 2, it's 2, right? It like averages out to be like, well, on average, each time I do a linear search, its size is like half of n. But I still have to do that n times. So you could be like, well, you know, it's like I have to do n over 2 work n times. And you might think to yourself, OK, so that's how good are these markers? That's OK. I have to do n over 2 work a total of n times, right? Right? But the funny thing about programmers is I could, let me rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite it like this. 1 half times n squared, right? It's, it's the same, right? I just rewrote it. The funny thing about programmers is that 1 half is a coefficient. We don't care about coefficients. We really don't. And the reason we don't care about coefficients when describing how much work that algorithm is doing is because we're not really describing how much work that algorithm is doing. Remember, when we analyze algorithms like this, we're always thinking about how much work the algorithm has to do relative to n and how that work changes relative to n. That 1 half, that coefficient, just scales whatever this is by half. But this right here, if I have a list of size n, how much work do I have to do? n squared divided by 2. But if I double n, I end up having to do like four times the amount of work here, right? Because it's, it's squared. And that 1 half really, you know, really doesn't matter. It's still scaling at a rate that looks like an n squared curve. Let me show you a plot just to emphasize. Uh, plot x and x squared and x squared divided by 2. All right, so the blue line is linear. The red line is quadratic, the squared. And the yellow line is uh, half of that as it goes. But what I want to really emphasize here, let me zoom out, is the x-axis will be how big n is. It is, I should have done it with n, but whatever. The x-axis is how big my list is, and the y-axis is the total amount of work happening. Look at the difference between n squared and n squared divided by 2 versus something that's linear. That, that one half thing doesn't matter at all to the total amount of work that's happening. It doesn't matter to the rate that it's scaling. Sure, it matters a little bit, but it's only this linear scaled amount that it matters. So we really don't care about that one half in front of it. The total amount of work here is n squared. Now, <coughs> if we think for a second, with this sorting algorithm, So you know how, with a linear search, there's that best case scenario. If I'm doing a linear search, the best case scenario is the thing I'm looking for is at index 0. Right? And if it is, the amount of work I do is like 1. The worst case scenario is it's at the end or not even in the list. Then the amount of work I have to do is n. Can you think of a best case scenario? and worst case scenario for this sorting algorithm. Take a moment and think. What would that be?
Here's the algorithm for selection sort, if you, if you care. Does anyone have any ideas on the best or worst case scenario? Exactly backwards is how I'd want to sort it. So why does that make it the worst case versus something else? Because it's going to maximize how far you have to search each time. But I have to, if I'm doing a linear search over here on the unsorted pile, I have to go through all n of them no matter what. I give you a trick question. There is no best or worst case scenario. It's all the worst case scenario. It's all n squared. I tried to trip you up. Of the algorithms that we're going to look at, this is, the, this is the worst. The next two we'll look at, insertion and bubble, have a best and worst case scenario. Kind of with your idea, basically based on your idea, just if they happen to be sorted already. Now let's have a look at the algorithm quickly here for a second. This part right here is the linear search. Do a linear search for the smallest thing in the collection. Once you find it, remove it and add it to the big collection and repeat this process, or pardon me, into the sorted collection, and repeat this process for each thing in the collection. Pretty cool. Any questions about selection sort? All right, insertion sort. It's kind of like the opposite of selection sort. Is instead of always appending the thing that we know where it goes to the end and doing a linear search over here, we just take something here and then we do a linear search of where it belongs over here. We just kind of flip where we're doing the linear search. So what I do is I take something off the pile, the unsorted pile. And I find where it belongs in the sorted pile. Well, right now it's empty, so I just put it here. I take the next thing, and I find where it belongs. If it's smaller than the thing at the beginning, I put it at the beginning. If it's bigger than the thing at the beginning, I put it after. I take the next thing. I find where it goes. Does it go in front, in between, after, whatever. I just do a linear search to find where it belongs. And I repeat this process over and over and over again. Let's jump down to the code real quick. <coughs> For each element in the collection, well, i is less than the length of the sorted collection, so this right here is just the length of the sorted collection. You know, it starts at 0, then it becomes 1, because I'm adding to it every time. So i, just to make sure I'm not going out of bounds there, because this is the linear search on the sorted collection to find where it goes. So well, i is less than the length of the sorted collection, and sorted collection at index i is less than the element. Meaning, this might sound like a lot right there, but slow it down. I've got a sorted, I want to find where this goes in this collection right here. And I go, hey, uh, what do I ask? I ask, uh, hey, sorted collection index i, are you less than this? If, if this is less than this, where must this go relative to this? Before it. No, th this is smaller than the thing I want to ask. So where does this go relative to that? Should it go over here or over here? Assuming bigger things over here is correct. I realize I didn't say that. So I do it again. Hey, uh, is there still any indices left? And are you, are, are you smaller than this? If you're smaller than this, I know this must come after you. If I ever get to the end, that whole I thing, 
The farmer gets to the end and I didn't find anything that didn't flip that if statement, meaning I never found something in here that was bigger than this. Where must this go? At the end. At the end. Exactly. Why? Well, if I never found something bigger than this, that must mean this must be the biggest thing that would be in there. If I'm going along and I ever get to a case where I'm like, okay, is this thing, if this thing is bigger than this, I know that this must actually have to come before this. Now, Let's think for a moment. Let me, let me go. I'll draw some numbers and no pen. If I'm going along, and I'm looking at the number 10. And I, I, let's say I want to insert the number uh, 18. I'm going to come along and I'm going to say, hey, uh, <coughs> 10, are you uh, less than 18? Yeah, all right, I got to keep looking. I go to the next thing, 14, are you less than 18? Yeah, all right, so I know I got to keep looking. I know 18 must come after 14. I get to 17. I said, hey, 17, are you less than 18? Yeah. Okay, great. I know 18 must come after 17. So then I go to 24 and I say, hey, 24, are you less than 18? No. Okay. Well, I just concluded, a moment ago, I just concluded that 18 must come after 17. Right? And now I'm saying, well, 18 is less than 24, meaning 18 must come before 24. So if it must come after 17, but before 24, where do I put it? Between those two things. It almost sounds like a stupid question, right? Like Between those two things, exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to move these ones on down so I can put 18 where it belongs. And the easiest way to do that in Python, I mean, there's a lot of ways we could do that, but the easiest way to do that in Python if we're using lists is just to use the insert, I believe, insert at a specific index, the element. That will push everything else down for us. This is just right here. Take an element, do a linear search to find where it belongs in the inserted list. And the reason this works is, I'm just going to take an arbitrary thing, and when I'm adding it to the list, it's always a sorted list that I'm adding it to. And when I do a linear search for where it belongs, we're just going to do that process we just did the example of. I'm going to find where it belongs and put it there. It's going to maintain its orderedness. It can't get unsorted by inserting something where it belongs into the sorted list. Now. Let's think about the amount of work this algorithm has to do. I'm going to take something out of here. And I want to do a linear search to find where it belongs in the sorted pile. How much work does it need, do I need to do for a linear search in a general case, a, a list of size n? n? So I have to do a linear search that takes n times n amounts of work, pardon me. And how many times do I have to do linear searches? How big is this pile? n. So I have to do n linear searches. And each linear search takes n units of work. So that's n units of work, n times, n squared. But again, we have that funny little thing of like, well, you know, really, the first time we do the linear search, it's empty. Next time, there's only one thing in there, then two, then three. It's only the last thing we're adding where I need to look at all n, right? So on average, how big is the sorted pile throughout this algorithm? It's not a trick question. Half of n. Half of n. 
Because for every for when it's size zero, it's n. Size one, it's n minus one, and so on and so on and so on. So on average, it's half of n. But the same thing holds. We don't care about those coefficients. Now, what is the best and worst case scenario here? The best case scenario is, well, think, think about what the best and worst case scenario must be. I've got an unsorted, I've got a pile here that I'm, it's unsorted, as far as I know. I'm going to take the thing off the top and insert it into the sorted pile. What would be the worst case scenario and best, best case scenario for this algorithm? I'll tell you what they are. The best case scenario is order n. The worst case scenario is n squared. But what must be the case about the input of data to cause the best and worst case scenario? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Any ideas? What do we think? What do you think? Uh, for the best case scenario, it would be in the reverse order. Reverse order. So what you're saying is, I end up taking the biggest element out. I put it over here. I take the next element out, which just so happens to be the next smallest element. And I say, hey, uh, do you come before this? Oh, yes, it does. So I just insert it at the beginning. Meaning, I didn't really need to do a linear search here. I just added it right to the beginning. I just got lucky. I take the next thing out, which happens to be the next smallest thing that would belong in the beginning, and I find out where it belongs in here, and I check the first thing and go, oh, it must come in front of the first thing. And I do this over and over and over. That's absolutely right. The best case scenario is if you give me the, the data sorted in the reverse order. If that happens, I have to take n things off this pile, but my linear search every time just so happens to always take one amount of work, one unit of work, constant time work. The size of that pile doesn't affect how long it takes in this circumstance. That's what you meant, right? So what would the worst case scenario be? This one's a hard one to come up with if you know what the best case scenario is. What do you think? It's already sorted. If it's already sorted. Imagine that. You get data that's already sorted, and this actually is the worst case scenario. Why? Well, I take the smallest thing, and I go, great, you belong here. I take the next smallest thing. I have, like, I, I, every time I take the next smallest thing out, it would be the biggest thing that gets added to here. Because it must be bigger than everything in the sorted pile already. Meaning I have to go all the way to the end to add it. Over and over and over again. So every single time, that linear search to find where it belongs always takes the most amount of time it could ever take. So you're right. The worst case scenario is if it's already sorted, which is ridiculous, right? I want to see if I can find. Here. So, okay, yeah, got it, great. Um, so here's a couple of cases. So what we have here is, that's weird. I have insertion sort here. And selection sort. Selection sort was the first one we did, right? And I'm going to hit play on this. 
And there's a couple of different cases. One is random configuration of the data. One is the data is nearly sorted. Another one is the data is sorted in the reverse direction. And this is a few uniques, whatever. I'm going to hit run here. And this is selection. <clears throat> and no matter what the case is, they all finish at the same time. Now insertion will be a little different, because insertion we had a best and a worst case scenario. Now I will say, the fact that the best case scenario was reverse order, and the worst case scenario was in order, really is a consequence of how we implement the algorithm. Because there's nothing stopping us from doing a linear search in reverse order. Someone could do that. Therefore, what the best and worst case scenario is will depend on the specific implementation of the search of the sort. But we do know that the best and worst will be those extremes, one or the other. Yeah? Are you able to do like a linear search and then like when you're putting it into the new list, make a third one? So say if there's duplicates like the new unique one, they put these um, duplicates into another file, so then you're only a remainder with one of each in the question. I mean, you, yeah, there's nothing stopping you if that's what you want it to do. So you can't do it? Pardon? You can do it. If you want it, yeah. So let's, I'm going to hit run on insertion, and let's see if they all finish at the same time. So here, based on their implementation, insertion sort, the nearly sorted was done the fastest. And the reverse order was the slowest. But when, watch closely about where the, where the arrow is going. Based on the direction of that arrow, which direction do you think the linear search is going for where it belongs? The opposite of what we talked about. That's just an arbitrary implementation detail. Usually why someone would want to do it that way is they're using one, one list to sort it and they just like move backwards in the list to find where it belongs because I can always just move things down. It's an implementation detail. But the point is, nearly sorted in reverse are the two extremes. We're going to look at bubble sort on Thursday. <clears throat> bubble sort was done like immediately on the nearly sorted and reverse order is also the slowest here. Now here's a good sort. Merge sort. This sort, oh let me take a step back. Insertion and selection, I mean I guess you know selection was kind of worse because you could get there's, there's no lucky case where insertion, you could get lucky, right? But they're both terrible algorithms. Bubble sort is also a terrible algorithm. But then there's heap sort and quick sort and a variety of other ones. But I said heap, I meant to say merge, but heap is also great too. But merge sort is way better. Merge sort is objectively way faster than the other sort. But it requires some interesting things. But we'll talk about that later. Anyways, that's it for today.